For whatever reason, long ago in the past, there existed powers deadly enough to destroy the entire world. Three weapons bearing the names of gods, Pluton, Uranus, and Poseidon. And if the rest of the world caught wind of this secret, then everything would be thrown into chaos. Hello and welcome to One Piece 101, the series that breaks down everyone and everything within the One Piece world. And today, we're going to be examining a more meta aspect of the series, being three particular existences that hold the power to turn the world completely on its head, being the Ancient Weapons. The Ancient Weapons are a collective of three items that take radically different forms, capable of mass destruction on a scale that we have never seen within the series. They provide unparalleled power, and throughout the series, obtaining them has been, and will continue to be, used as a primary motivation for many characters, arcs, and even entire sagas. As such, the Ancient Weapons are used as reasoning by the world government to forbid research into the mysterious Void Century, although the extent to which this may be simple propaganda is unknown, as it could also be very much out of the pure desire to maintain balance within the world and prevent it from falling swiftly into anarchy. Anarchy. But in direct correlation with said power, each of these three weapons have been named after a different real world deity, and they are Pluton, Poseidon, and Uranus, also known as Uranus. Haha, <laughs> it's funny. And we're going to begin with Pluton, as it is probably the simplest of the three, and the most incorporated thus far into the story of One Piece as we know it. Pluton is supposedly a massive warship, and while its true capabilities are unknown, it has been said that whoever controls this weapon would undoubtedly have the potential to take over the entire world. And not only that, but Pluton is particularly terrifying because it is a man-made construct, meaning that it does not necessarily need to be a unique existence. So as long as plans exist to make another, which they did, it would be entirely possible to bring multiple Plutons into this world and cause untold devastation. Now, what we do know for a fact is that the original Pluton was constructed on the shipbuilding island of Water 7 during the Void Century, which was roughly eight to 900 years prior to the current timeline. During this period, Pluton was used as an asset during the Great War, a conflict that we know very, very little about, except that it ended around the year 722, after which point Pluton was retired into inactivity. What we don't necessarily know is which faction of the war created and used Pluton, but most evidence would point to the enigma that is the Great Kingdom, the faction that would lose the war, having been defeated by the 20 kingdoms who would later become known as the world government. However, what points to the idea that Pluton was under control of the Great Kingdom is that its location is logged on a poneglyph, which resides deeply within the nation of Alabasta. It has also been hinted that Pluton itself may have been hidden on Alabasta, which is an interesting thought because their monarchy, the Nefertari family, made up one part of the 20 kingdoms that would have fought in the Great War. Although most notably, they were the only regal line to reject moving to the Holy Land of Marijuana, so you know there's a lot more to Alabasta than meets the eye. However, this would not go on to work in their favor, as at some stage during the modern era, then Warlord of the Sea Sir Crocodile set his sights on obtaining the ancient weapon Pluton, and in an effort to gain access to the Alabaster Poneglyph, he manipulated the entire kingdom into civil war. This would of course be stopped by one Monkey D. Luffy and several Straw Hats, but this event was much more significant than I think most fans realize. As should Luffy have failed, it's entirely possible that Crocodile would have come to possess Pluton, and may now even be regarded as the most fearsome pirate in the entire world, perhaps even becoming the Pirate King. This this is not the only attempt an individual has made over the years to obtain Pluton though, as Spandam, a prominent figure amongst the Cypher Bowl cells, lobbied the Gorosei, imploring them to allow him to attain Pluton in order to bring the Great Age of Piracy to an end. And rather uncharacteristically, Spandam excelled at this task, managing to connect the weapon to the island of Water 7, and even track down the individual in possession of its blueprints, the shipwright Tom. Now Tom is probably best known as the man who constructed the Orage Axon, the vessel that the Roger Pirates used to reach Laugh Tale, and have Roger become the Pirate King. However, Tom also held much more important influence on the world, as the blueprints of Pluton had been passed down through a line of superb shipwrights for centuries on end, with the idea being that they were to construct a second Pluton should the first one ever re-emerge into the world. And as we know, Tom's story ended rather tragically, as is the fate of all mentor figures in the series. He entrusted Pluton's blueprints to his two apprentices, Iceberg and Cutty Flam the latter of whom is better known now as Frankie. And this really is what sparked the entire Water 7 saga in the series, with Spandam sending his agents to infiltrate the island with the mission to rob Iceberg of the plans. However, as it turns out, Iceberg had elected to keep the blueprints hidden with Frankie, and it would not be until the events of any slobby where Frankie revealed them, before promptly setting them on fire, thus preventing a second Pluton from ever being introduced into this world. Of course, that does also mean that should the original one ever resurface, then there will be nothing to rival its power. 
Nothing that isn't another of the ancient weapons, of course, because we do still have two more to explore and we're going to continue with Poseidon. Now Poseidon, in stark contrast to Pluton, is not an object, but is in fact an innate power that is inherited through a line of mermaid princesses of the Ryuku family. And what Poseidon effectively does is grant its user the ability to communicate with sea kings. And that might seem a bit underwhelming at first, but we do need to remember that sea kings, apart from unique creatures like Sunisha, are by far the most dangerous non-humanoid beings in this world, so much so that their breeding ground within the calm belt form a near impossible barrier to use to penetrate into the Grand Line. Their power is immense, so much so that they are said to be able to sink entire islands with ease. So they very much rival, if not potentially surpass the capabilities of Pluton, especially when we consider that the large majority of One Piece is an island-based world. But it's not quite as simple as sicking Sea Kings on a target, because Poseidon is a bit more nuanced than that, allowing its user to form a sort of empathetic connection with Sea Kings. So if Poseidon is distressed, the Sea Kings will feel this and then move to act to stop it in whatever way they can. And such an action might be to rid Poseidon of whoever or whatever is distressing them. But this also means that the Sea Kings can respond to other desires as well. As seen during the climax of the Fisherman Island arc, when Shirahoshi, the current wielder of Poseidon, was able to call upon them to prevent the Noah from colliding with and destroying Fishman Island. With that said, it is unclear if Poseidon can straight up control the actions of Sea Kings. And at this stage, it's perceived as more of the Sea Kings responding of their own accord to a distress call of some kind. So their actions may be entirely up to them, but the ability to communicate with and more importantly express emotions to them is exceptionally dangerous nonetheless. Although unlike Pluton, which seems almost exclusively destructive, there is great potential within Poseidon to be exclusively beneficial to the world. In fact, at one stage in history, the original Poseidon made a pact with a figure known only as Joy Boy, seeking to use her powers and have the Sea Kings bring the Noah to the surface and instigate its intended mission, which you know was more than likely to ferry the entirety of the Fishman race to the human realm to live in equality on the surface. Although rather unfortunately, for reasons unknown at the time of this recording, Joy Boy failed in his part of the pact and even left an apology letter in the form of a poneglyph. Meanwhile, another poneglyph was created that would eventually end up on Skypea, detailing to future generations that Poseidon could be found on Fishman Island. And once again, Poseidon is currently the mermaid princess Shirahoshi. And finally, let's talk about Uranus, or at the very least, what we can about it, because at the moment, this ancient weapon lies in almost complete mystery. In fact, the most we know is that like the other two, it existed during the void century, but other than that, it's pretty much 100% speculation. But since we like a bit of the old speculation, I will say that one thought states that since Poseidon is ascribed to mermaids, while Pluton was created by humans, then it would make thematic sense for Uranus to be a product or power of the sky people. And on this train of thought, I now present to you NL's great space operations. One of my favorite cover stories in One Piece that sees NL travel up to the moon, or one of the moons, via his Arc Maxim, and encounters a race of highly advanced robots, as well as a group of space pirates. But during this time, NL also encounters some ancient paintings upon the moon, which would actually appear to depict this ancient race of robots on a vessel of some kind, capable of traveling within the sky and possibly even through outer space. And if I was a betting man, I'd say that this was Oda heavily hinting that Uranus is something along these lines, or at the very least, related to this in the the same way that Poseidon is related to the movement of the Fishmen. But at the same time, there is a massive, massive chance that I would lose that bet because of how unpredictable Oda is. So for now, we'll just have to sit tight regarding Uranus, although we are getting to the business end of the series now, so we probably won't be waiting too much longer. Some more fun facts about the ancient weapons. Each of the ancient weapons is named after a Greco-Roman god with an association to a particular plane. So for example, Pluton takes its name from Pluto, who ruled the underworld and believed that all mineral wealth within the earth belonged to him. Meanwhile, Poseidon was a well-known ruler of the sea, while Uranus was something of a personification of the sky. While nothing else in canon has stated to be able to equal the destructive qualities of the ancient weapons, we do have a non-canon example of a rival power, being the Dinostones, which were the main feature of One Piece film Z. And to be fair to these non-canon objects, they were completely capable of destroying entire islands with ease after being exposed to simple oxygen. However, they are once again, not canon, and we're going to resume forgetting about them in three, two, one. And finally, a truly useless fact, the only two straw hats who have not touched an ancient weapon are Zoro and Frankie, because they were suspiciously absent from the promise that the rest of the crew made with Shirahoshi to take her up to the surface.
But that pretty much does it for the ancient weapons. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but apply to other anime and manga series, then please do feel free to check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenanigans retakes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with who, what, or where you'd like to see featured on the next One Piece 101. Do you think you will ever do a versus battle series on characters? I would love it. All right, so you know, this is something I've been toying around with quite a bit actually, because I think I'd rather enjoy making a series like that where every week we're just pitting two random characters against each other and trying to figure out who would win based on all available evidence in the series. It's also one of those things where you would probably never run out of content either because One Piece is just so rich in characters and infinite in possible combinations of them. So like you'd have some obvious matchups like Zoro versus Sanji, but then you could also go into more obscure and arguably more fun matchups like, I don't know, Karabo versus Whoop Slap. Well, maybe not Whoop Slap, but you get the idea. There's an infinity of videos lying in wait for such a concept. The only thing is trying to figure out exactly how many people would like to see something like that, because committing to a series like this is much more of an endeavor than doing like a random one-off video exploring who would win Zoro versus Sanji. So if versus matchups are a thing you'd like to see on this channel, then please do say so in the comments below. And you know what? You can even feel free to post any matchups that you would like to see covered if such a thing did end up happening.